All right, we'll call the meeting to order. Um, Beth, please call the roll. Mr. Bodie? Here. Mrs. Gephardt? Here. Mr. Gousset? Here. Mrs. Matney? Here. Ms. Wassman? Here. Pledge of, allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Moving on to on the minutes, is there a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Um, any comments, questions, or discussion? Okay, Beth, please call the vote. Mr. Bodie? Aye. Mrs. Gephardt? Aye. Mr. Gousset? Aye. Mrs. Matney? Aye. Ms. Wasma? Aye. Okay, do we have a recognition of academic achievement or outstanding contribution? We do not. Okay. Uh, recognition of guests and hearing of the public. Is there anyone who would like to speak for the board? Uh, moving right along, we have a presentation on social and emotional learning and mental health from Robert Brown. Hello, good evening. Give me a second while I feel free to talk amongst yourselves. While you <laughs> <up>. <laughs> Anything we say gets recorded, so. <laughs> Mr. Brown and his wife are expecting. No. It took, it took three seconds too long to. <laughs> <laughs> That's so exciting. Up. Congratulations. Yes, we're having a little girl in early March. So. Aww. Yeah, we're very excited. I'm a big First yeah. kid, so. You know, I'm really excited. I wanted to slow down and speed up somehow. <laughs> okay. Sweet now. Congrats. <laughs> That's what I hear. Yeah. That's what I hear. Um, Okay, good evening. Uh, this evening, I'm going to take you through an overview of the framework we use to determine or to ensure we are addressing student mental well being, not just their academic well being. So, first, I know education is full of jargon and acronyms. So, first, we're going to start with some definitions. I thought everybody would appreciate that. Um, first definition is MTSS. So, last year, um, I presented on MTSS, which, which stands for Multi Tier System of Supports. And so, last year, if you remember, I presented on that on how it is a systemic approach to layers of student support. Uh, it's a framework to provide academic, behavioral, social, emotional strategies to students with a variety of needs. It's just, it explains the tiers of how we support students. PBIS is Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports, which is a proactive school-wide approach to promoting positive behavior in educational settings. Emphasizes teaching and reinforcing positive behaviors while systemically addressing challenging behaviors through a tiered framework of interventions that support social, emotional, and academic success for all students. I won't refer to PBIS and MTSS as much as the next few. So tier one, um, what does tier one mean? Tier one is essentially just all students. It is, it is the curriculum and support that we provide for all students. So in a minute, I'll take you through tier one supports related to social emotional learning. But just to give you a quick example, um, if a teacher greets all students at the door, that is an easy um, tier one social emotional strategy that actually is quite effective. So something as powerful and simple as that um, is a tier one SEL support. Tier two, as you may have guessed, um, tier two is really um, just sort of that next layer. So individual or groups of students who need more support than tier one provides, um, just the next step in the series. Tier three is our final step, and these are individual student plans. So they could be IEPs, 504s, or what we refer to as MTSS tier three plans. Um, so we're just creating individual plans to meet student needs. And finally, SEL, I'll probably say SEL a lot. It is social emotional learning. Um, and I'll get what that means, in the, I'll get into what that means in the next slide, but I, I'm sure I will refer to SEL a lot. Okay, what is SEL? It is a growing area of interest in education due to the increase in child mental health diagnosis and trauma brought into the classroom every day. There is a lot of research, even um, since COVID, on social emotional learning and mental health, and I'm, I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Um, but what is, what is SEL? District-wide SEL focuses on creating safe and supportive environments, teaching students new skills, and using data to make informed decisions. 
the goal is really just to help students build competencies, understanding themselves and others while forming strong relationships and building decision-making skills. That really helps students learn and navigate the, the world more effectively. So why is it important? If a student is not meeting expectations, which may manifest through poor grades, poor attendance, um, undesirable behaviors, our, our teachers, counselors, and administrators seek to find the why through a root cause analysis. Often the cause of the challenge is not academic in nature, rather more of an SEL gap or mental health concern. SEL is an important component to ensure our students have mental health support, not just academic support. So whether it's academic or social emotional, we generally have three tiers of support. Tier one, so like I said, tier one means all students. Um, so what is tier one SEL support? Well, it can take many forms and it's probably best explained through examples, such as focusing on relationships and ensuring that all students have a trusted adult, having active and engaging lessons, um, it could be journal writing for self-reflection, uh, modeling for students that risk-taking and, and failure is okay, it's part of the process, uh, check-ins, flexible due dates, uh, giving students voice and choice in their learning, having routines, um, intentional student grouping to work on peer collaboration, responsive classroom where the instruction is evidence-based, um, but also about the individual students and their unique needs. Um, it's an approach to teaching that, that builds sense of community and connecting students to their interests. So that sounds pretty good, right? Is it occurring? Well, you think about that for a second. Yes, yes, it is occurring. Teachers are great about reflecting on their practice and adjusting to what students need, but they don't often recognize the work they are doing. So I'll give you an example. When um, I was a high school principal and I would do um, evaluations, so I'd go in to evaluate teachers, um, I'd do an observation, in the post-conference afterwards, I'd say to them, tell me about some of the SEL strategies you were using in the classroom. And many times you'd kind of get that look like, I don't, I don't know. Um, and then I would point out maybe 10 things they were doing and they'd say, oh, well, that, isn't that just good teaching? Well, yes, but um, also being intentional about what that looks like um, is important too. So yes, it is occurring. We also have teams in each building dedicated to looking at quantitative and qualitative tier one data. So each school has an MTSS team, um, and at different levels there are PBIS teams, there are grade level teams, and we have a district student services team that meets monthly. These groups look at tier one data like grades, attendance, behavior, social skills, relationships, patterns. Um, a student may not necessarily be struggling, but if they're showing patterns of downward regression, then that's important too. The data isn't always quantitative or individual, which you'll see when we talk about in tier two. But sticking with tier one for now, um, this year we gave two surveys during the fall. One for teachers and one for students. The student survey looked for two things. Do you have a trusted adult? And we did that K-12. And do you have a connection to school through clubs, sports, or activities? That was more 412. This data was then used to make student support decisions. At the middle and high school levels, if students are not involved in a club, we asked them what they would be involved in if we created it. Students at Larson were also asked how their school experience could be improved. Most of them said, longer lunch. <laughs> Which is exactly what I would have said at that age. <laughs> Might be what I'd say now as an adult. <laughs> um, uh, and as you can see from the, from the graph on the screen, so K-12 baseline data. So this is um, really before teachers had a, had a I mean, this was a couple months in, but they, they really, they didn't have a full year to build these relationships. 93% of our students report having at least one trusted adult at school. Now, this is one of those things where even one student not having a trusted adult is too many. But um, the relativity of this, I will tell you that a lot of districts are trying to get to 65%. So starting at 93% just is a testament to how our teachers and entire staff just focus on relationships with kids. Ask a quick question just so I don't forget sure. it. When you ask that, is it simply a yes no question or you ask that, do you actually have them write a name? Uh, we have them write a name. Okay, that's what I thought. Just yeah, and it looks different at the three different schools just based on like um, age appropriate right. questioning. But um, yeah, we thought about at the high school, for example, having a drop down, but we just didn't want people just picking yeah. names randomly, so right. they have to. Um, the, the, only, the, the, the one problem with that survey is it really highlights um, spelling concerns. <laughs> <laughs> Brown, hard. 
<laughs> yeah, that's been a couple different ways, yeah. Um, the teacher survey asked staff about how they implement tier one SEL in the classroom. Do they feel supported, trained, and prepared? What are some of the things they're doing that work? Uh, we got an entire, you should see the list we got back from, from staff of the things that they are doing in the classroom that are fantastic SEL strategies. Moving forward, we wanna take this data and work with teams of students and teachers on ways that we can generalize some of these strategies and others so that we can become more intentional. One thing is clear, SEL in the classroom cannot be one more thing. There's a couple of teachers on the board who probably agree with that. It can't be one more thing. Rather, we have to find a way to embed these strategies seamlessly into the curriculum, giving teachers a toolbox that they can use. So there's two places we wanna get better with tier one. More intentionality, like I just mentioned. Um, and two, we also want to adopt a screener to further add a touch point to our existing data. So we've been exploring like what those screeners look like K-12. So what happens when a student demonstrates more need than tier one can provide? Tier two. So whether that is an individual student need or a group of students, we move to tier two supports. And these are supports that are generally provided in a small group or even in a one-on-one -on -one setting depending on the need. This could be support for all students, but only at certain grade levels. And here are some examples. Um, we partner with Nationwide to bring in grief counselors when, when necessary. Our prevention programs, like the small groups that Centero runs through, using perseverance, goal setting, task initiation, healthy coping, and growth mindset. Our sixth grade female students this year are participating in the ROCKS program, which stands for Ruling Our Experiences, and is a 20-week small group curriculum designed to form healthy self-image, communication, um, communication with peers, safety, leadership, and stress management. Grades seven and 10 are going through signs of suicide screener, while students in grades four, four and five are participating in a sources of strength curriculum, which is an evidence-based social emotional learning curriculum that has proven outcomes with increasing healthy coping, um, help-seeking behaviors, connections, and trust towards adults. Uh, this program also includes high school mentors, which increases student buy-in, grades four and five. Tier two support could also be in response to a crisis that impacts a group of students or adults. So our crisis team would then assemble to discuss supports and next steps, which would look different with each unique situation. We also use tier one data to match students with support. So maybe a student has been um, disengaged in class. That student may meet with a school counselor or even their trusted adult depending on the issue and their preference to get some additional support. <clears throat> Tier two is usually the step where families are brought in, um, especially if it is a support for an individual student. Um, and there's a lot of overlap between tier one and tier two, um, but the big difference in general is that tier two includes more small group or specific grade bands based on um, some kind of data or, or evidence. And that brings us to tier three. These are individual plans for students. So um, tier, tier one wasn't enough, tier two wasn't enough. Um, now we move to tier three, which are individual plans. And so often, um, we start with what we call an MTSS tier three plan, which is an individualized plan tailored for students' unique needs, which may include mental health supplemental support. And I use the word supplemental because um, even though we have mental health supports available, um, since we're in a mental health facility, it is often supplemental to their outside services. Um, this is also the tier level where students might be referred for disability testing, in which some students may qualify for mental health services through an IEP or even a 504 plan. Um, and just as a reminder, an IEP addresses a disability that includes specialized instruction and services. It outlines special education needs based on the student's identified disability. It defines accommodations and modifications to curriculum. It also lists educational goals and any specialist or special services that they may need to meet those goals. A 504 plan provides educational accommodations to students who have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. A 504 plan is geared towards ensuring a student has equitable access to a learning environment and typically only includes accommodations, which are meant to level the playing field and ensure equal access for all students. Both of these formalized individual plans may include mental health supports. If that's the case, our district mental health specialist, who is a licensed social worker, 
may be directly involved in providing supplemental services and may work with teachers to help support student needs, giving the teachers the tools to work with those individual students based on their plan. The mental health specialist will work collaboratively with a student's outside therapist if parents grant that permission. That is entirely up to parents. So in summary, um, tier three should always include an individual student plan where the school staff works in collaboration with families and outside service providers to ensure students' needs are being met. That was a very quick overview of some of our SEL supports that we have in place for students. Um, in closing, I'd like to say that I get to work with a student services team that includes counselors, school psychologists, mental health professionals that are extremely talented, hardworking, and most of all, caring. They are the ones that put this all into place. I know I mentioned a lot of programs, so if you would like the links or connected to experts or a more, more thorough explanation of any of these programs, I can get that all to you pretty quickly. Beyond that, are there any questions I can either answer or look further into for the board? Can I ask a little bit about the staff? I've, I don't think I've ever fully appreciated the difference in the roles between a school psychologist and a guidance counselor and a mental health specialist and how their roles differ from each other. Yeah, a, uh, um, there's, there's a lot of moving parts and pieces, but um, school psychologists in general, so we have a preschool through third grade school psychologist in Abby Keller, and then we have a fourth grade through 12th grade school psychologist in Kelly Berlin. Um, the bulk of their time, I'd say 90% of their time is with disability testing. And so if a uh, disability is suspected, um, they, they'll come to the planning meeting with the parents, um, they'll decide what testing is necessary. The testing takes a pretty long time, it's pretty thorough, and then they'll put the report together, which takes a long time and is pretty thorough. Um, and then a meeting is held, do, do we suspect a disability? Um, and then they stay involved with, with the IEP writing. The IEP is written from the evaluation report that the school psychologists produce. And so between evaluations and re-evaluations, that is the bulk of their time. They also handle the, the 504s. Um, the mental health specialist, really, she provides that supplemental um, support where she's meeting with individual students who have an identified disability that includes mental health. Um, but she also, um, you know, is, is a major part of our crisis team and our student services team and, you know, works with teachers and provides PD and does a lot of trauma-informed care for teachers and those sorts of things. But um, one of her main roles is, roles is meeting with um, students and also helping families get connected to outside supports. Is that, did I miss the? Oh, the guidance counselors, and then I know there's, well, there's Stephanie, and then mm -hmm. Abby and Brian. Yeah. Stephanie is our K-3 um, school counselor, and so the, the school counselor's role really has morphed into a lot of different things. And so a lot of requirements that have come down from the state and a lot of the needs of the schools just keep sort of increasing. And so um, their roles are, are, are ever-changing. Um, they, do, they do meet with students. Um, they typically wouldn't meet with students in that tier three support. Usually that's the, the school social worker or Sintero. Um, but they meet with students, they help with planning, they help with scheduling. Um, it really just depends on what, what grade level they're in. So um, Stephanie Duran is our, our K3 elementary um, counselor. Abby Malley is our 4-8 counselor and, and Brian Stork is our 9-12 counselor. And so depending on grade levels, their roles look very different, but they're very involved in MTSS process. I believe each of the counselors is the MTSS coordinator for their school. And so they help coordinate um, the, the planning and interventions and then the uh, um, individual plans for students. Um, a lot with, uh, I said, scheduling. Um, they do a lot um, working with, with teachers and grade levels to, to make sure that all students are getting what they need. Um, work pretty closely with families um, on, on a variety of needs. Um, but but their, their roles, uh, you know, Brian, for example, at the high school spends a lot of time with graduation requirements and, you know, our students on track for honors diploma, like keeping track of all that, meeting with kids, making sure, you know, meeting with families too. Um, the pathways, you know, all the industry credentials that are coming out and um, keeping up with all that is, uh, is a lot. Um, he does it very well, but um, that's a lot. And Janie O'Shaughnessy is our college and career counselor um, and mostly focusing on, on college. Um, and, and helping students and, and families prepare for that. Um, and she's, you know, with the, with the career um, pathways increasing, she's also jumped aboard that too. So, and Liz Wagner was our Sintero counselor, but sadly she left us recently to take a job in Olentangy. So 
um, she was stolen away from us. Thank you. Mr. <laughs> Gousset, if you're involved in that, I'm not sure. I don't know if you're involved in that or not, but um, she did an excellent job for us. Uh, Sintero is really, um, as, as you're aware, uh, mental health and social workers and mental health counselors are in high demand, and so um, Sintero has not been able to send us a uh, replacement. That's helpful. Thank you. Thanks for going through the different uh, tiers. A couple of uh, particular tier one supports that I would like to commend, um, the Bobcat group mm -hmm. in the middle school, I think is a wonderful program and is really successful, at least in my own experience. And some of the dog videos that Stephanie Duran made oh my gosh. during COVID yes. were seriously <laughs> So wonderful. Good. They were wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, they were great. And memorable. They were, they were great for the kids. <laughs> yeah. I so agree. Those are two things that stick out to me. And I, I would consider those tier one because they were available to yes. every single kid. Yes. I think, they, I think they had a huge impact. Yes. Yeah, I went through a few tier one examples, but I mean, I, I could fill up this whole board meeting with just tier one examples from the classroom. It's, I mean, there's a lot of great stuff going on. We want to be more intentional and, and <laughs> about how we're doing it and when we're doing it, where we're doing it. But yeah. it's, the, the good news is it's, it's been naturally occurring. And, and I just want to kind of harness said, it. These are things that are happening. Teachers are already doing this. Mm -hmm. They just don't realize it. Yeah. So yeah. They're doing it well. So thanks. Any other discussion? Thank you, Rob. Thank you. That's good. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Rob. All right, are we ready to move on to the superintendent's report? Yes, <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to be brief tonight. Um, I wanted to just outline and focus on uh, November 28th, Grandview High School is engaged in a district-wide day of service, reflective of our strategic plan priorities. The learning was personalized and grade level appropriate, self-directed and enabled student ownership, as well as providing an internal and external cultural and community experience. Um, not that it was perfect because we learned a lot and we can use what we learned as we segue into next year to make it even better. But uh, I'm not gonna read the rest, but I wanted to spotlight that. Um, and also just thank Angie Olm for her leadership in helping us develop that. Um, much appreciated. I wanna highlight, uh, just to save the date, as I think all of you know we've been working hard on a master plan for Stevenson Elementary and we're getting close to having that relatively finalized and we are going to hold a community-wide meeting on Wednesday January 24th at 6 30 p.m. at Stevenson in the gymnasium to share the culmination or outcome of that master plan and so I wanted to put a plug in to save the date for that. Um, also, we, uh, you can watch live stream our girls and boys basketball games at the link uh, attached. Um, and that is always very exciting. And so with that, um, that's my update. Any comments or questions from the board? All right, Beth, moving on to the treasurer's presentation. Okay. Um, I have some financial highlights, and mine will be brief as well, and then a um, quick update on our bond millage setting process. Um, so as of the end of November, um, our revenue is pretty much where we expect it to be. Um, our taxes, our homestead and rollback, our Grandview Yard revenue remains unchanged, um, just below, each of them are just a little below 50%, which is what we would expect for um, having received just the second half of the calendar year settlement so far. Um, state funding, about 48%. Um, that's right on target with what we expect. And I wanted to highlight the interest earnings. Um, so f almost $53,000 of interest earnings just for the month of November, which is fantastic. Um, about 326,000 uh, fiscal year to date, so the first five months of the year. So we're really um, taking advantage of those interest rates being where they are um, with our cash balance. Um, expenditures, we are just about 1% um, higher than um, fiscal year to date, what our budget would be. Um, so we'll continue to monitor that. And the investments, 
Um, our, our investment account with US Bank is just under 3% um, weighted average yield. And our Star Ohio at the end of November was almost 5.6. Um, so that's great. That's the liquid account that we, we um, have a good chunk of our money in. So a couple highlights, permanent improvement fund. There's actually, there's no change from last month. Um, the unencumbered fund balance decreased a little bit. Um, the projects are the same. Uh, the construction fund, we are winding down to the very end. Um, had a little bit more interest uh, for November, about $2,500. And the project to date, um, since we issued those bonds, um, $2,020,953. So that has, of course, been a, a huge help to the, to the project. And we do expect to have um, some money remaining um, once we pay our last couple bills that are outstanding right now. Um, and then finally, wanted to give you a quick update. We talked about the bond um, millage setting process at the last meeting in October, and I wanted to give you, a, or in November, I'm sorry, and I wanted to give you a quick update on what has occurred since then. Um, so quick recap, that millage is um, a little bit different than general fund or PI fund, permanent improvement. It's recalculated each year based on how much money we need to make our bond principal and interest payments. So each year, we, um, I, I complete a certification to the Franklin County Auditor's Office that tells them how much cash we have on hand in that fund, um, what our bond payments are for the next year, and whether we have any additional funds available to help offset those costs. And, and typically, most school districts would not have um, you know, additional funds besides the, the tax revenue from the bond. Um, our situation is um, we have the revenue from the Grandview Yard that was pledged to put towards the bond payments to reduce what we have to collect from taxpayers. So the amount that we will use next year in 2024 um, generated from Grandview Yard funds um, is $908,906. So that amount was on the certification that I sent to the county auditor. And then the county auditor uses that cash balance plus what we expect um, compared to what we need to pay and calculates the millage based on our updated valuation. And so that millage rate for 2024 is gonna be 3.25 mils. And that's down from 3.7 um, this year. Um, that millage calculation was sent to me on the 28th, and I signed um, to agree to that and sent it back. And then, of course, the, the new millage goes into effect in January for 2024. So um, just wrapping up then, I wanted to give you a quick recap of where that bond millage has been over the last um, eight or nine years. The, the red bars are the 1994 levy. As, as we were getting close to the end, that millage um, you know, steadily dropped. The, the final year of collection and payments on that was 2019, and that was also the first year of collection on the new um, 2018 uh, levy. So you can see we kind of phased that in so that it, it, it um, uh, goes then from 2020 was the first full year of um, collections on that. So the, the plan at the time that we issued those bonds was that the millage would be pretty much flat over the course of the bond issue, meaning we needed to generate about the same amount of money over the course each year. And as valuation has increased in Grandview, the, the millage rates you can see have, have um, steadily uh, dropped a little bit. So it's the same amount of dollars that, that we had planned for back in 2018, but, but the simple math equation of valuation times rate equals dollars, as that valuation has gone up, the, the rates can go down to still generate the same amount of money that we need to make that payment. So, um, so 3.25 will be the rate for 2024. So that's it, unless there's any questions. So the valuations used uh, 
for that bond millage calculation don't yet include even the reappraisal that will be in effect? It does include it, the it reappraisal. It does, okay, yes. okay. Yes, so the reappraisal values, um, that ha the reappraisal that has taken place in 2023 um, is effective for 2024. And so that's why it's this late in the year before we know what that millage is, is because they, they have to wait until those values are certified until they know what those are gonna be. Okay. Um, so yes, that does take, which is why it dropped from 3.7 to 3.25 is that, that offsetting increase from the reappraisal. Any other questions? No. Okay. Thank you, Beth. Uh -huh. Okay, under business and finance, C recommendations, we have uh, one through... 13. Is there a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Any discussion? So 1 through 12. Is, it, is there, oh, I think there was one added, right? Yes, yeah, I sorry, the Concordatus um, uh, yeah. cost estimate for Stevenson was added. Yep, got it. Got it. Can, um, Andy, can you explain number seven, the RFP for national? Yeah, I can, that's, that's a great question, Katie. So um, our school district is one of many that are in a um, consortium for the purchase of electricity and natural gas. And it's just, it, it takes advantage of the buying power of, of a large number of school districts. And so um, this is the participation resolution to participate in that same consortium that we have been in for years. Um, so yeah. Thank you. It's, it's all the meta schools, um, Columbus Public Schools, um, Southwestern. Um, it's a very, very large number of schools, and, and it definitely helps us on the, the rates we get. Looks like um, I know, remember Jesse Truitt always used to do this, and it was a good thing to, to recognize the donations because mm -hmm. there's, um, in particular, there's a very generous donation there to the robotics team. Mm -hmm. um, that deserves, you know, appreciation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Well, if there's no more comments, then uh, Beth, can you please call the roll? Mr. Bodie. Aye. Mrs. Gephardt. Aye. Aye. Mr. Gousset. Aye. Mrs. Matney. Aye. And Ms. Wasmith. Aye. Okay. Personnel. Um, we have a one through eleven. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any um, discussion? All right, hearing none, Beth, please call the roll. Mr. Bodie? Aye. Mrs. Gephardt? Aye. Mr. Gousset? Aye. Mrs. Matney? Aye. And Ms. Wasma? Aye. <clears throat> Is there a policy committee report? Uh, we did not meet. However, we are going to be voting on a number of policies today that might come up for discussion. Um, but we didn't have any, we didn't have a meeting this month. Okay, as Kevin mentioned, we do have a number of um, policies uh, to vote on. So under recommendations, it's B1 with a lot of letters under there. Um, is, is there a motion? Sorry. So moved. Second. Any questions? Now, this is the second reading, so we, we did discuss these somewhat last time. All right. Hearing none, Beth, can you please call the roll? Mr. Bodie? Aye. Mrs. Gephardt? Aye. Mr. Gousset? Aye. Mrs. Matney? Aye. Ms. Wasmuth? Um, I'm voting no, but can I explain? Mm -hmm. um, the GBCC and GBG. They're required. It doesn't really matter which way I vote. I think it opens us up to vagueness. Policy should be black and white. I think this is gray. So I'm no. Everything else is fine. <laughs> um, is there a teaching and learning committee report? Um, yes, we met yesterday. Um, Angie gave us an update on the different committees that are working on the school in the different areas on uh, grading policies, pedagogy, <laughs> two. pathways. Pathways, yes, we had a really great discussion about pathways yesterday, which was exciting. 
Um, and days of service were the main things that we talked about, yeah. Yeah, so I don't think there's anything else to discuss. Okay. I'm sorry. There is a recommendation um, to vote on uh, for under curriculum and instruction B1. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion on this? You want to talk about it at all? Do you want to say anything? So uh, we have been discussing this for uh, a, an extensive period of time. And on <clears throat> Monday, April 8th, uh, I'm told there is a once in a hundred year event that is going to occur in an, in an eclipse. And it is, the trajectory is scheduled to occur in or around 245 that day. I'm told or as I understand it, the best viewing is northeast, sorry, northwest of Columbus in around 45, 50 minutes. And there is a lot of interest in going somewhere northwest of here to view this eclipse. I'm told that the best viewing is in that area. Um, and so correspondingly, we brainstormed a myriad of options. So, for example, we brainstormed not doing an early release, and uh, but like in or around 2:30, having everyone go over to um, the football stadium with glasses. Um, because of the best viewing area being northwest of here, um, the prevailing view was, and correspondingly, the proposal to the board for board approval is to do a half day, which would allow students, staff, families to make a personal choice to travel or not, but under the supervision of their parents, uh, observe the eclipse. Uh, we are purchasing glasses approved for all students, all staff. Um, and so the, pro what, the, the only other thing I would add is, uh, you know, my network through Central Ohio Superintendent Association um, th this seems to be commensurate with what other districts in Central Ohio are also doing. So we, we certainly are anything but alone in this proposal. Is it, is it, are we in coordination with or are we just kind of um, advertising a, a Parks and Rec event that's going to be happening at Wyden Woods? Yeah, maybe Angie, would you mind talking about that? So I do know, I know Angie has met with them multiple times. I apologize, Angie, for putting you on the spot. That's okay. Um, yes, we are in coordination with them. So originally, we thought it was going to be a half-day release, and we tried to do something on that day. But our seventh-grade students, who are sixth-grade students last year, started doing some inquiry work around the um, space um, huddle, and so they are very interested in the eclipse so now that same group wants to plan something so now we're hosting two events instead of one but the students feel like it would be better and more people will come if we can do it on the weekend so we're going to do a two-hour event that's all space oriented activities in conjunction with parks and rec so parks and rec is going to run it but the students and the teachers are planning it hmm. which the kids are thrilled about um, mm -hmm. and the teachers were very very kind in saying 100 percent will come on Saturday so we're going to do a two-hour event and th the way we kind of have it planned right now um, the students will create the activities but it'll be around the walking path at um, Wyman Woods so you have to walk all the way around the path to do all the activities because there's nothing worse than doing an activity and creating it and no one coming to your station so Parks and Rec is going to help facilitate that and then Parks and Rec will be hosting just a viewing. Um, Musicology is going to do music on the lawn at Wyman Woods and people can bring their blankets and the library is also purchasing more glasses as well because it's really, the most dangerous time is the 15 minutes before the eclipse when kids are like, I can't see it, I can't see it, and they don't have their glasses on. <laughs> they need to have their glasses on. So they're purchasing extra, Parks and Rec are purchasing some glasses the, li the library is involved in this too, and they're purchasing glasses, and I've already purchased our glasses for all of our students and, and staff members. Okay, thanks. Sure. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we've already taken the motion. So, Beth, can you please call the roll? Mr. Bodie? Aye. Mrs. Gephardt? Aye. Mr. Gousset? Aye. Mrs. Matney? Aye. 
Ms. Wasmuth. Aye. And I apologize, I was noting earlier that I never um, asked for the Finance Committee report back when we did the Treasurer's presentation, but I believe you said you guys did not meet, is that correct? Right. That's correct. <laughs> so, my apologies, I skipped over that, but. Worked out well. Yeah, <laughs> it did. Okay, now moving on to the volunteers uh, list for approval, so. Um, 12A1, do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right, Beth, can you please call the roll? Mm -hmm. Mr. Bodie? Aye. Mrs. Gephardt? Aye. Mr. Gousset? Aye. Mrs. Matney? Aye. Ms. Wasman? Aye. Okay, now we do have something under other today. We have to elect a president pro temper for the organizational meeting in January. Um, so for the logistics on this, do we need a motion to even take a motion before we start the discussion on this at all? Or do we need, we need a name before we can have a motion? Okay. Yep. Yeah. All right. I move to nominate Emily Gephardt. So Is do there we. A second. Second. So okay. now we can have discussion. Now we can discuss that. Is there a discussion? What's the discussion about? Whether well, do we like Emily? <laughs> we talk about her now Please. on the minutes. <laughs> All right, like in the great again. <laughs> <laughs> about whether you think I'm qualified well, to run the business the meeting at the beginning of January. <laughs> oh. It's 15 minutes long, right? It's, it's about 15 minutes <laughs> Just <making laughs> before <sure>. we <laughs> figure out the next year. Okay, so then I think. Um, do we want to go ahead and vote on this and then take up two? Mm -hmm. Okay, Beth, please call the roll. Okay, Mr. Bodie? Aye. Mrs. Gephardt? Aye. Mr. Gousset? Aye. Mrs. Matney? Aye. Ms. Wasmuth? Aye. Okay, now for the January 24th meeting date and time, um, we need to set an organizational meeting. And it has to be prior to when? 15th. Prior to the 15th. And if we stick on our standard schedule January on Wednesdays, 10th. that puts us there. Okay. Right, yep. So, January. if we're looking at January 10th at 7 o'clock with the tax budget, oh, what's usually 15 minutes beforehand? Yeah, 6.45. 6.45. Um, is there a motion for that? 6.45 January 10th. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I could make the motion for that. If I make a motion for January for an organizational meeting at January 10th at 7 o'clock with the tax budget hearing at 6.45. It would follow our same schedule on Wednesdays. Okay. I'll second that. Okay. You, moved, you moved it, right? Yes. Yeah, I'll second Okay, Beth, please call the roll. Mr. Bodie? Aye. Mrs. Gephardt? Aye. Mr. Gousset? Aye. Mrs. Matney? Aye. Ms. Wasmuth? Aye. All right, we do not have executive session, but um, is there any other additional business that's not listed on the agenda that anyone would like to raise? Okay, hearing none, then um, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put all three of you down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Beth, please call the roll. Mr. Bodie? Aye. Mrs. Gephardt? Aye. Mr. Gousset? Aye. Mrs. Matney? Aye. Ms. Wasmuth? Aye. 